Well, history painting in the, in the traditions of the academy and actually from the Renaissance down was any painting that dealt with a big subject belonging either to biblical history or to uh, you know, Greco-Roman history that was then recreated or to current events basically of the time of the paintings. The Coronation of Napoleon by David, for example, is a history painting. The Oath of Horatii is also a history painting, even though it's a kind of costume drama history painting. Uh, Raft of the Medusa is a history painting. The Liberty of Eden, the People is a history painting. And there's this, this grand tradition. And in, in the academies of the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, it was the highest level of painting you could make. Um, the still life genre, painting, landscape, and so on, portraits, all lower. In the 20th century, there's been very little of it. Uh, Guernica is a history painting. Um, and then Richter, in a sense, has, has revived the genre uh, and given it a kind of legitimacy that I think no one expected that it would ever have again. Because traditionally, history painting has celebrated the powerful. It has celebrated agreed upon um, tenets of a society. It's the voice of authority in painting. The Badr-Meinhof paintings are the opposite. They do not celebrate the powerful, they celebrate the challenge to power, uh, the futility of that challenge ultimately, I think, uh, but also the aspects of it that are tragic and troubling, but shows a collision of ideologies and the absolute ghastly consequences. Richter, in a sense, comes from an episode in history where he basically lived through two murderous ideologies, first the Third Reich and secondly, um, you know, Stalinist kind of communism so that he's entered into this field by doing the opposite of everything that anybody ever did traditionally and at the same time dealing with history directly as a subject matter, dealing with it as if it was a piece of common property, but rather than the basis for agreement, what we share is what we disagree, so to speak, about. And that's, that's, that's why the paintings mean something socially. The new painting, the September painting, is an example of this again. In terms of his own experience, it has many different components, I think. Um, the simplest one is that he was in the air on his way to New York, on the way to this gallery, uh, on September 11th, 1901, uh, 2001, excuse me. He was, in a sense, a, a part of that particular moment since his flight was rerouted to Halifax, since he had to change his plans, and since the world that he was flying into it was suddenly completely disrupted by this event. Beyond that, of course, because of the Bader Meinhof paintings and because of his long reflection on terrorism, the use of terror as a tactic in politics, much of what was done in the 19th centuries by terror groups, the hijacking of planes, the blowing up of banks, was a symbolic action against the state of some kind. The goal was not, in fact, to do anything much other than disrupt power, show that it could be done, uh, challenge the sense of decorum with which people live their daily lives and so on. The attack on the World Trade Center was recorded by so many people on film because it was seen by so many people uh, who were present at the site and because it was like the Pentagon, uh, the, the site they chose was you know, sort of the symbol of American commerce as the Pentagon is the symbol of American military force. He took something where, if you will, the symbolism of the people who did it was the first threshold of understanding and then made a painting about all the ambiguities. Another major component is his youth. He was born in Dresden and that he went to school in Dresden, although uh, he was living in a little town at the time the Dresden bombing took place. It was probably the most damaging and um, frankly ruthless attack on the city uh, during the war. The Luftwaffe had started this by bombing Coventry at the beginning of the war and the Americans uh, finished it, if you will, by bombing Tokyo and Nagasaki in Hiroshima, but in this particular case, uh, British bombers uh, went after what was largely a civilian target and created vastly more destruction than was complete conceivable for any military reason. Richter heard the bombing from a distance where he lived. He had family, he had, I, think, I believe, an aunt who was living in the city at the time of it. And then when he went back to school uh, in Dresden, after the war, the ruins of the city were still all around. So the idea of a, a military attack on a civilian target 
of uh, completely um, disregarding the casualties of non-combatants. All of this was, I think, something that was also in the back of his mind. It's not Richter's way to make accusations. It's not Richter's way to uh, enter into the sort of decision-making, the politics, the ideology of these things, but rather to register the fact of it. In Richter's work, there's a lot that addresses war, usually somewhat obliquely. I think, and he said as much, that um, just after the war, he wanted in no way to put himself in a position of being a kind of a moral voice above and beyond the experience of others around him. Uh, his father had been a soldier in the Second World War. Uh, his uncle had been a soldier in the Second World War and had been killed, and he made portraits of both. Uh, and he made particularly the, the portrait of Uncle Rudy, which is of a young, eager German soldier ready to go off to war. Um, as it happened, he was killed almost immediately. And the particular predicate for that picture is very important because it was painted by Richter in part in response to an invitation from René Bloch, who was doing a show in Czechoslovakia uh, that was expressly meant to commemorate the Lidice massacre um, by German soldiers of an entire Czech village. And he, of course, gave the painting uh, away uh, when asked to do so to a museum in Czechoslovakia, which now still has it. Uh, but it's a rather an extraordinary thing for a young German artist to paint his uncle, who was the apple of his mother's eye, who was the man he was supposed to grow up and be rather than his father, who she thought was kind of a, a, a ne'er-do-well, um, to paint the image of this young conquering or about to be conquering German officer and to give it to uh, the country that uh, Hitler annexed and then um, you know, did terrible damage to. Uh, and Richter is acutely aware of all of these ironies and, and is trying to bring, if you will, all of the contradictions of modern history to the surface in these kinds of pictures. And then there's a whole series of pictures that he painted of military aircraft. Um, B-28s, the principal Allied bombing plane, unleashing bombs, paintings of Stukas, which were, of course, the fighter planes that the, that the Nazis had. Uh, and he also painted paintings of, um, if you will, the wars of the future or the, the wars that might have happened, which are essentially pictures of uh, military aircraft uh, connected to NATO and connected to the, the, the partial remilitarization of Germany. So that he was aware that during this time, which is the 60s, the early 60s, the time of the Berlin Wall, the time of uh, the, the sort of most intense Cold War, that he, like all other Germans, were sitting basically on the, the, uh, the battlefield for a potential confrontation between the Soviet bloc and, and, and NATO. And so if you painted those pictures, they were pictures of a portent. I mean, they were a portent of what could happen, was likely at that point, it seemed likely at that point. Then he made a series of pictures called Stadtbilder, or city pictures, basically cityscapes. In some cases, the pictures focus on the new architecture of the post-war era, uh, which is to say this very clean-cut, organized, uh, urban design settings with modern buildings. And it depends on whose eyes you have and what memory you have, but if you look at those pictures now, probably it doesn't come out so clearly, but I'm sure for myself and for other people who can think back a little bit to that point, not quite so far back, but can remember, you know, a Europe which was still rebuilding, and certainly for people who were living it. Any building that new implicitly had a ruin underneath it, so to speak, you know, so that even in referencing the future, you were also referencing the past. But then there's a whole series of pictures where the painting technique is a kind of a loose, brushy technique, and he's plugging in values and he's plugging in forms, but he does it in a way that makes it look as if the buildings he's trying to bring forward in the image are actually crumbling before your eyes or in the case of uh, a painting made of um, the cathedral in Milan and the Galleria, um, it's done in a, in a sort of striated system so that it's as if these buildings are shaking. Now, what's the source of the shaking? There's no explanation at all. But the idea that the sort of monumentality of, of Europe, you know, old Europe, Gothic Europe, and modern 19th century Europe is really just that fragile is part of the consciousness that comes from having actually known that it was that fragile and having seen it destroyed. The relationship between Atlas, which is this compendium of all the images, not all, but many of the images he's used and many he's thought about using but decided not to, the relationship between Atlas and his actual production is very interesting because for Richter, part of the process is recognizing a subject, 
The decision to actually make an image out of it is another step, and of course, the decision to keep that image is still another step, since uh, he's obliterated uh, many pictures. The, the cancellation of an image, the finding of an image, and then the making and keeping of images are all different locations, if you will, in this reflection. Now, in the original casting call for his 48 Portraits, which was his entry in the, in the Venice Biennale in 1972, were some 300 images, and among them were images of Mao uh, and of other famous political, I think Bismarck was in it, there were lots of different people, and he took all of them out. The single most provocative image probably of all of these is an image of Hitler, and it exists in two or actually three versions, uh, and one of them was shown in Wuppertal in the early 60s. Um, the second exists still under a coat of white paint on the back of the painting Stag, uh, and it's a picture of Hitler sort of, uh, you know, exhorting the crowd, shrieking in the, in the way that he did, and very recognizably him. This opens up the whole category of those things which Richter thinks of as being unpaintable. It's a category almost in his work, that which is unpaintable. I think the reason he would say that something is unpaintable is not uh, in any way like uh, the sort of average taboo. Um, you know, he's not afraid of taboos, um, and he has certainly violated many of them over the course of the years. But to be unpaintable is, I think for him, something that is, on the contrary, too easily understood, too easily grasped. And if you, if you paint a hot button issue or image or whatever it is, uh, in a way that leads to only one conclusion, that makes it unpaintable. Richter doesn't use the word abstraction by itself, certainly not non-objective, which is another um, uh, code, if you will, for certain kinds of modernist painting. He talks about abstract pictures. Uh, and that, I think, comes from a variety of concerns. On the one hand, a good many of his abstractions actually are depictions of paintings which are gestural paintings, but they're not gestural paintings themselves. Uh, it comes from the fact that he believes fundamentally that we see pictorially that we don't see abstraction. We always try to associate the thing we see with something that it might be or something that it might represent, which is why you know, the famous um, business about looking up at the ceiling where there are cracks and trying to find a face in the cracks, uh, which I think comes from the Renaissance, maybe even from Leonardo. But you know, people, people resist, or have until recently, uh, resist the idea of something that is thoroughly not mimetic, that refuses to be a, a picture in some way. So, all of that is part of it. But in this particular case, in the case of the September painting, he's clearly uh, narrowed the gap between a certain kind of abstract picture which does not, in fact, have an image behind it or an image in mind, and a picture which clearly does, but where that image has begun to become illegible or has begun to dissolve or disintegrate before your eyes. Now, at one level, that disintegration is literally what he's depicting. I mean, he's depicting the second airplane uh, flying into the South Tower of the World Trade Center, and he's depicting the impact of that. And that, of course, uh, created a chain of events, a chain reaction, uh, which brought both towers down. Um, so that you're, you're seeing the, the time before the literal uh, atomization of a modernist building, and you're seeing the moment of the atomization of the terrorists in the plane and the people who were the passengers and the people who were in the offices where the plane uh, hit. The sense that you have of the image dissolving in front of your eyes is in fact part of its representation. Now, he does this in a very uh, unusual way, I'd have to say, although like all great things, the simplicity of it is what's really striking. Rather than trying to create with the brush the illusion of a cloud of dust, what he did was to paint the whole scene and to scrape away that top surface of pigment, which uh, exposes the canvas underneath as a series of white dots, the weave and the tooth of the canvas, which muddies the colors, which were clear blue, kind of cobalt blue, uh, between the two buildings, then become a dirty blue, and then in turn the, 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 the grays that make the building themselves become slightly tinted with blue. Uh, the, the oranges that were in the explosion part of the picture again, are uh, brought way, way down by the scraping because, of course, orange and uh, blue are complements. So when you run them together, they, they go to gray or brown. Uh, so the whole picture uh, is physically made, or is undone, if you will, in a way that it, it stands for the building itself being undone. Uh, and by that same token, uh, 
it brings it into the zone of a lot of abstract paintings that he made um, in the 1990s and since, which are small, relatively small rectangles uh, and not really monochromes, but uh, in the gray scale, in the gray zone, uh, and where the act of you know, spreading, the, spreading the paint and then uh, reversing directions or doing something which further mixes it on the surface brings the whole image down to this very sort of low visual um, leaden kind of uh, quality. Another part of this whole phenomenon has to do with the fact that history painting traditionally, I think as uh, one knows, is grand in scale. Um, it, it's, it's, it's bigger than life, and that was part of the way in which these paintings were used, was to overwhelm the viewer by throwing him into the middle of some dramatic scene, some battle or some you know, scene of whatever kind. We now see the big events of the world on a television screen about this big, um, or sometimes even smaller, <laughs> but in any case, we see them on television screens so that, and this particular event was seen on television screens by millions upon millions of people, and it was intended to be seen on television screens by millions and millions of people by the men who perpetrated it. The, 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 the knowledge that, in fact, they were, they were indeed bombing the, uh, the place where an awful lot of the, the um, uh, television antennas were located, but the idea that you, would, that you would do this was in order to have maximum visibility for the act. And the natural format, so to speak, it's not natural at all, but the format we're accustomed to, uh, is about like so. So when Richter chose this scale, he chose on the one hand a scale which is anti-dramatic, specifically aimed at not being the big heroic picture of a kind that uh, would have been the case in the, in the past. And secondarily, that he decided, I think, uh, I don't know if this is conscious or not, but it seems to me as a, as a viewer clear, that he decided to put it in the frame or format of the way in which we normally receive these images so that the correlation between the doing and the undoing of the image was directly juxtaposition to the, the, the manner in which we receive these images, which is television. The important thing in, 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 in choosing this image is, uh, number one, the things he did not paint. Um, he did not paint images of people diving out of the building. And there are some amazing images of that kind. They're excruciating to look at. But it's also true that in that case, those are about singular deaths. They're not about the aggregate of the death. And they're not about a, a kind of larger phenomenon of this kind of uh, attack on civilians. Uh, he didn't choose to paint ruins. He chose the, the point at which the event happens, and it's the moment, if you will, of destruction, but it's a moment which is unreachable. It's, it's a moment which is already out of time in some way. If you pr want to sort of represent violence, uh, that second when death takes place is the focus of many, many photographs. Famous photographs of Robert Kappa, famous photographs of the, the uh, Vietnamese colonel uh, executing a Viet Cong. Um, there are many, many, many of them. Uh, and there's also the whole tradition uh, coming out of Cartier-Bresson of what's called decisive moment photography, where it, in a way you, you, you fetishize that instant where something occurs as if it captured the essence of everything in its environment uh, like no other instant. Richter has taken actually the instant, or at least the very, very short sequence of time in which the plane hit, but also undone, if you will, its symbolic quality to a certain extent, and also made it not, as I said, about an individual death, but about a death which touches simultaneously the perpetrators and the people whom they attacked. 